welcome to another episode of Living Room Wisdom, where your story is your glory. I am Petrina Wisdom, author, speaker, and wealth mentor. And today I get an opportunity to interview Miss Sharon Jameson from the Jameson Group. Tell me this woman is not gorgeous. If you guys are on YouTube, or you already see the beautifulness, the regalness of this woman. But if you're on Apple or Spotify, you need to go over to YouTube and check her out. So I just had to say that first off, because you are absolutely gorgeous. And it's not a physical gorgeous. It is literally, when you walk in the room, your spirit just lights up the room. So I want to honor you for that, appreciate you for that, welcome you to the Living Room Wisdom chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, before we jump into what you do, I just want you to tell a little bit about yourself sure. and, and where this natural joy and, and shine comes from. First, I am so grateful to be here. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful for an opportunity to share. Mm. It is so important um, and such a privilege to be around positive women. Yeah. Women who know that what they are called to do. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful to be here with you. I would say I'm many things, like many women. Yes. I am a minister. I am an author. I'm a corporate leader mm. in a pharmaceutical company. I'm a mom. Yes. Um, I'm also a, a DEI consultant. I work yeah. many, with many faith based organizations as well as corporations to really challenge themselves around diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. and, and belonging and justice. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a self-liberation advocate. Okay. And what that means is that I work with people to help them be who they were created to be mm -hmm. and to stop settling for what society has taught and told us to be. Yeah. Because society has not given many of us great messages about our self-value, right. about our, our dignity, about our humanity. Mm -hmm. And until we can extract and discern between society and self mm -hmm. and culture in our own character, we will never be who I believe God has called us to be. And so I do that decolonization, decluttering type of work so that people could can really be free. Yes. And free in a way that's meaningful to them because to them. we all define freedom differently. I love the word that you used, decolonization. Mm -hmm. That's not something I hear every day. Mm -hmm. And I I know that that stems from some of your personal experience growing up as a black woman and I would love for you to share some of the experiences that we talked about in our intro. Sure, sure. I was born in the 60s mm -hmm. and so I started school in the 70s, early 70s in St. Louis, Missouri and, and at that time society was grappling with integration mm -hmm. because at that time they were doing a lot of busing where they would bus the black kids over to the white schools and it was in those white schools that I started started losing myself. Mm. I am a minister's kid and I was really always cherished and supported in the in the community. I was, you know, the PK, so to speak. Right. So I always had a, a healthy sense of self until integration. Oh, wow. And so I went to school at five years old thinking I was beautiful and brilliant and, and the cat's meow. And in less than two weeks, I started feeling like I was nothing, that mm. I was dirty, that I was stupid. Um, for example, in kindergarten, I moved too quickly and the teacher that I was attacking her and she took a chair and hit me in the head wow. um, in uh, second grade I was on the monkey bars playing by myself and the kids knocked me down I um, fell on my head and had a mild concussion mm -hmm. and the school nurse at that time we had school nurses early mm -hmm. in the 70s did not call my mom because she said that she thought that Negras had harder heads and so I was in the school all day uh, with uh, a mild concussion and, and nobody called my mom. Mm -hmm. And then in third grade, I remember going down the steps and a kid knocked me, pushed me down the steps and cracked my skull wide open. Mm -hmm. And I remember tasting my own blood. And so those types of experiences continued till I was about 12 and 13. So I fell into a deep depression and because people don't understand racism is not only emotionally and psychologically violent, it's physically violent. Right. And when you have a, a society or a system that tries to um, dehumanize you mm. and to rob you of your dignity, to rob you of your hope, 
Many times you start inculcating those messages because when you swim in water, toxic water, after a while, yeah. that toxic water lives in you. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go through a healing process and, de and a decolonization process so I could learn right. what it meant to be a black woman. Mm -hmm. So I can remember, reclaim my heritage mm -hmm. so that I can understand that we come from a wealth, an ancestry full of doctors and lawyers and mathematicians and astronomers. Yeah. A lot of the things that people think now were invented by people who look like you and I. Right. And I had to learn that. I had to find places and people to mirror what it meant to be black mm -hmm. and beautiful and brilliant and 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 great right. and excellence. And so that was my journey. And it was a very painful journey. I'm because sure. you know, uh, when mm -hmm. you are in school and society is teaching you that everything that looks like you is less than, I had to reclaim myself and and that is why I do the work that I do now. That makes sense. And what age were you when you reclaimed yourself and stepped back into your queenship? Yeah, I would say around 10 or 11 years old. Mm -hmm. I went through a, a terrible, terrible uh, deep depression. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea, in, it was so depressing that back then we didn't go to therapists and psychologists, right? right? So I used food. And so in the midst of maybe three months, I gained 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I started to go through a sister circle. So that's mm -hmm. when I started understanding the power of community. Yeah. And also start learning my history. Start learning about, you know, um, Bell Hooks and Dr. Maya Angelou. Angelou. Start learning about James Baldwin and all those beautiful, powerful people that helped me see what it meant to be bold and beautiful and black. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and gifted. And so after that learning experience that helped me to understand what I was made of, mm -hmm. and I uh, have been working to continue to decolonize my mind yeah. and to continually call forth my ancestor wisdom, and I teach women to do the same. Yeah, I love it. And I remember when we connected and then you sent over your website, and the first thing I saw when I went to your website was Dare to Soar. Yes. And your beautiful, just energetic, regal self on that web. I mean, she has the most beautiful website ever. And then when you meet her in person and she shows up and, and it's literally like you just stepped out of your website. It's kind of amazing. So I love the work that you're doing. I love just everything that you stand for. And so tell me a little bit about, uh, first off, I know you're a mom. How many children do you have? Only one. That was just a full-time job. I have, <laughs> I have one son, but yes. I had three stepkids and I had six foster kids. Mm -hmm. So I, And I also raised my sister. Wow. So I raised a lot of children, and I'm grateful for that. But mm -hmm. after I had my my son, mm -hmm. I know it was done. Like I don't want any more kids. I right. wanted to, I wanted to be a mother. I didn't want to go through pregnancy, yeah. and I want to let every woman know that that mm -hmm. pregnancy and motherhood is not Two for every things. woman. Yeah, it's true. And it's okay. Yeah. So then your journey with all of these children mm -hmm. that you raised how did you decolonize or contribute mm -hmm. to their decolonization mm -hmm. and helping them really have a clear sense of self because you're doing it in your work for you know hundreds and thousands of people but how is that trickling into your family life sure i think everything i do is really based on three principles mm -hmm. the first principle not only of my business but also my personal mantra is education mm -hmm. i think one of the ways that we help people is to help them understand who they are mm -hmm. outside of the lens of the white gaze right. and outside of the lens of historical uh, narratives that don't lift us up as authorities, yeah. as of as of kings and queens. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of um, education that's really, really important. I also help people understand how systemic oppression and systems of oppression impact our thought system. I, I think when, when you understand how white supremacy shows up, mm -hmm. not only as racism, but as sexism, mm. ageism, uh, ableism, homophobia, xenophobia, all those different ways that we deny people their dignity. Mm -hmm. You are able to understand that it's not just an individual person, it's a system right. that you have to be able to discern, mm -hmm. but also dissect so you can understand what's you and what's not you. Yeah. And so I think that education is always really important. I always tell people you have to know who you 
are, mm-hmm. but you also have to know who you are not that because part. society will bombard you with messages yes. that will make you not love yourself. Mm-hmm. Because if you're, if the messages uh, show that are portrayed, mm-hmm. portray portray you in a very pejorative way, mm-hmm. you won't see beauty in somebody that looks like you. Right. And one of the things we have to see, we have to see mirrors. Yeah. We have to see examples. We mm-hmm. have to see not just mere here mere declaration you have to see demonstration yeah demonstration you have to see examples of mm-hmm. what success looks like in a person mm-hmm. who looks just like you or position I didn't is realize important. how important that was until recently mm-hmm. um, I mean for myself I don't know I just feel like I had never I didn't never really think of myself as a color not a color mm-hmm. I was just a human being going through life having an experience mm-hmm. and I love everybody and it wasn't until recently when I started look it will first off seeing all of the things going on Mm -hmm. in the world of course that brings more awareness but also just the documentaries like even with feminism and not seeing women portrayed Mm -hmm. in the media Mm -hmm. and the the messages that we receive and the thoughts and identities that we take on based on that let alone color and everything Mm -hmm. else so it is extremely important and that actually is a great segue for me to talk to you about your career also in the Mm -hmm. pharmaceutical I can't talk the pharmaceutical the pharmaceutical Mm -hmm. realm Mm -hmm. because to my knowledge there are not a lot of you know beautiful sophisticated black women in power in the pharmaceutical industry absolutely so tell me about that experience oh gosh I've been in the pharmaceutical industry since I graduated from college in the 80s in the mid 80s 1985 and when I went when I got into the industry almost four decades ago Mm -hmm. it was very white male Mm -hmm. white straight male sure Um, now I would say it's still very white male Mm -hmm. but we are seeing um, the upsurge of of more uh, diverse people, primarily because um, the culture is changing, so the census is changing, yes. and also health inequities. I think COVID has demonstrated what it mm-hmm. what it means to have a lot of social determinants impact someone's access to care, mm-hmm. but also to understand how stress impacts our systems. Yes. We find that mm-hmm. if you look at the research, many people of color, mm-hmm. I don't care if it's brown, indigenous, Latinx, we have higher incidence of blood pressure, yeah. high, diabetes, um, cancer and we know that there's a stress related component to that mm. so it's really important that I do this work because I do a lot of work around health equity in the pharmaceutical industry to, to make sure that we are involved in clinical trials mm. to make sure that we are involved in the marketing uh, decisions to make sure that we support black and brown physicians and providers and nurse practitioners as they care for the least of these right. we have to remember that um, a system our healthcare system was not made for people who look like us. Hmm. And so we have to insert ourselves in ways, mm-hmm. but also under, let people know that healthcare is not something that you make political. It mm-hmm. is a human rights issue mm-hmm. that people have the opportunity and the privilege to access healthcare. And so I do a lot of work around health equity now in the pharmaceutical industry, and I'm really, really grateful mm-hmm. that I allow all my life to, 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 co- uh, to coalesce. For example, yes. you know, I am in health equity and I yes. and, and also diversity in the pharmaceutical industry. I am a minister, a progressive minister. I believe that Jesus is connected to justice. Yes. So we do a lot of work around inclusion. Yes. We do a lot of work to support same sex marriage. Yes. We do a lot of work to under to understand the impact of mm. political decisions on our spiritual health. Mm. I don't think people understand that policies impact emotional health, which impacts spiritual health. That makes sense. And so we're doing a lot of work trying to show how those those different parts of us need to be attended to Mm -hmm. in ways that we can be healthy and then that's why I use those parts of me then I write books and I do a lot of coaching for executive coaches so that they can understand that they can lead in a way that honors them Mm -hmm. if you think about how we are taught to lead it's a very white male model of leadership Mm -hmm. and so it's really important to to demonstrate to black women to brown women to to non non non-binary people 
that there's a way to lead that's liberating. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, and if you lead in a way that honors you mm -hmm. and honors other people, you will be more successful. Mm -hmm. People will have a sense of belonging. People will share. People will um, be more creative and innovative. Mm -hmm. So it's just not something that we should do because it's the right thing to do. It's something that we should do because it is the holy thing to do. Right. To honor people and allow people to contribute to whatever, mm -hmm. wherever they are. Because mm -hmm. if not, if we don't allow people to have a sense of belonging and to participate, we lose a high percentage of, of um, performance, mm -hmm. of innovation and expertise. Yes. And so that's really, really critical. Especially you're now. a beautiful example of this, by oh, the way. And one thing I love is when you connect with someone virtually or, you know, you see someone on a show or on a podcast or mm -hmm. whatever it is, and you connect with them, but then you meet them in person and it's exactly the oh. same feeling. That's like, it's very authentic. And I just, yeah. I love that. I definitely feel that with you. So everything you're saying, you're in integrity with. I can feel that. Mm -hmm. What I want to know as we bring this episode to a close is with you, because you're also an activist, it yeah. sounds like, right? So you're an activist, right? right? And so um, how are you able to maintain mm -hmm. with all of the awareness you have and all the education and the insights to all of the different just all of the things that are going on, the disparities, all of this, how do you keep the joy? Oh, what a great, great question. My joy is because I'm doing what my creator has called me to do. Right. I feel in total alignment. Yes. And even though I do different things, it's really all of three things, mm -hmm. justice, mm -hmm. liberation, and love. I love it. And so, so if I, then those are the lenses that I look through when I, in my corporate job, in my ministry job, in my business, and as a coach and as a writer. And because I feel if we create a just society, we are loving people. Mm -hmm. uh, Cornel West says that justice is love out loud. Mm -hmm. And so and I know if I'm being just and making sure that people feel like they feel seen, heard, and respected, there you go. we won't have to worry so much about war. Yes. We worry about war because some people don't feel seen, mm -hmm. they feel taken advantage of, they feel dehumanized and degraded. Mm -hmm. But what could we accomplish mm -hmm. if people felt heard, known, and respected right. for who they are, to be able to love who they want to love, pray how they want to pray, right. eat how they want to eat, mm -hmm. and then be able and willing to share their own wisdom because every culture has a piece of the puzzle that the rest of us need exactly and so that's that's my hope that's my joy that's my desire and mm -hmm. uh, that's my prayer God give me the courage to do it mm -hmm. and my other prayer is God show me who I was was before society told me who I was not mm -hmm. because I'm still learning what God has taught me to be mm -hmm. because I learned not to like myself yeah I learned to hate myself and so I'm always asking God God show me who you had in mind what you had in mind when you created me yeah. so that I can do your work yeah. and do your work in a way that I can lead with love and mm -hmm. as long as I have love I've always have joy and now that you've unlearned mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and you've stepped fully into who you really are and the power of what you have to offer in the world, mm -hmm. what does the second half of life look like for you? You know, I think the second half of life looks like doing this work more on a global, uh, global, on a global scale. scale. Okay. Um, my goal is to, you know, write a, a new book every two weeks. I mean, every two years. Every I was about to say every two weeks. So I have, I have nine books. <laughs> So I have, I have four books of my own, and I'm part of four anthologies, and then I have a, a reflection guide. My goals would be to write a, a book every two years. Okay. I want to write a book for women over 50 okay. to let them know that they still have the power to reimagine and reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. My father used to say, you're not done until you're dead, and I want people to know that you're never done. If you yeah. have a pulse, you have a purpose. I love and it. And that's really, really important. I also want to uh, find ways to use my money as active. Okay. Um, I'm very blessed. I know mm -hmm. that is nothing but God, yes. blessed in favor. But I want to use my money as a form of activism to open up schools and to, to, to fund businesses to take care of old people. Mm -hmm. um, I never really thought about what it meant to be 70 and 80 and couldn't afford your medication until my mm -hmm. parents got that old. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that it is my commitment to take care of people, like the Bible says, mm -hmm. the sick, mm -hmm. the widows, 
the children and the, old, the elders. Yeah. And I want to take care of the elders because I honor the sacrifices that they made so that I can do what I do. I know mm -hmm. I stand on shoulders. So that's that's my goal. That's I what it. I see myself doing in the next two to five years when I finally leave corporate America. Right now, mm -hmm. I love what I do, mm -hmm. but, and I think we need a black voice at the table right. to talk about health equity. So maybe you mentor and train and someone so I'm the person to yes, until replace I'm yourself yeah. before you exit. Yeah, I that's love my it. Goal. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here. And I'm so glad we were able to connect in person. Mm -hmm. And I just love your spirit. I love your energy. I love what you're doing. And I definitely want to stay connected. Well, I'm grateful to be here. I'm yeah. grateful for your work. Thank you. And my prayer for you is that God gives you the desires of your heart and blesses the fruit of your hands. Thank so good you. luck to you. And, and so it is. Out. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell everybody how they can connect with you before we sure. go? Everything is Sharon Jameson. My website, Instagram, everything is Sharon Jameson. If you connect with me, I would love to connect back. Mm -hmm. And I would love for people to take advantage of my newsletter. I send mm -hmm. out something every week. Uh, some tips, some sermon or something that's really um, resonating with me. And I would love for people to engage with me because I would love to engage with them. Because mm -hmm. I learn best from people. Because yes. I learn what they need. And I want to exactly. make sure that whatever I, I put out in the world that is relevant and also revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And that's my goal. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Living Room Wisdom, where your story is your glory. Go ahead over to YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Patrina Wisdom, to see interviews like this every single week. And then also go over to Facebook and join our Facebook community, the Badass Bodacious Entrepreneurs. We look forward to engaging with you there. Have a wonderful afternoon and thank you again. I am Patrina Wisdom. Namaste and we'll see you next week.